Section twenty three of Birds and Nature, Volume ten, Number three, October nineteen o one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Diana Schmidt. A Lost Flower. More than a hundred years ago, a new flower was found in the wild and rugged mountains of North Carolina by Michaud, a Frenchman who had traversed many lands and known many perils and adventures in his search for rare plants. He had traveled through his native country in Spain, climbed the Pyrenees, crossed sea and desert, been despoiled by Arab robbers, so that he arrived in Persia with nothing but his books left to him of his baggage. Luckily, he cured the shah of an illness and was allowed to carry back to France many eastern plants. He was then sent by his country to explore the forests of North America. In the mountainous country of North Carolina there were no roads, only Indian trails, traversed by a few missionaries and traders. In this wild and lonely region he found a new flower that belonged to no recognized genus and was mentioned by no previous botanist. It was a modest little flower. Its pure white cup rises on a wand-like stem in the midst of shining and tender leaves, round in shape and prettily edged. He secured a specimen, but he had no leisure to study its habits in the Montagne Sauvages, as he called these mountains in his own language. Rumors reached him of the French Revolution, and he immediately hastened to return home. He was shipwrecked on the voyage and lost nearly all his collections. From this time the flower was lost, so far as any knowledge of its existence was concerned. But after the death of Michaud, our botanist, Dr. Asa Gray, happened to be in Paris with the son, the younger Michaud, also a lover of plants. Very naturally, Michaud showed his American guest his father's new specimens of American plants that had escaped the shipwreck, and Dr. Gray was much interested in this little flower marked unknown. When he returned to the United States, he sought it in vain. All trace seemed to have disappeared. Year after year, when he heard of anyone going to the North Carolina mountains, he would beg the person to look for the lost flower. At last, someone, by chance, found a blossom in early spring growing in a different locality and not recognizing its genus or species, sent it to Dr. Gray as one of the highest botanical authorities. As soon as Dr. Gray saw it, he exclaimed with delight, Why, this is the little unknown flower of Michaud. After its strange disappearance of a century, it had again come to light. It has since been found in various parts of Upper South Carolina, and is now cultivated by more than one florist and grower of rare plants. Its leaves are like those of the southern wild flower, the Galax akin to the pixie or flowering moss so it has been placed in the same family and named shortia galassifolia i e with a leaf like gallax the first name is given in honor of short the botanist a lovely way of keeping alive the remembrance of one who loved flowers ella f mosby end of section twenty three Section 24 of Birds and Nature, Volume 10, Number 3, October 1901. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in February 2018. Section 24. The Polar Bear. Ursus Maritimus. The polar bear is the only aquatic member of the family being often called sea bear, as the scientific name, Ursus maritimus, signifies. It is practically confined to the Arctic zone, although various unwilling visitants have come as far south as Iceland and Newfoundland on the floating cakes of ice. 
in size the polar bear ranks next to the grizzly with a doubt perhaps in his favor he has the longest neck of any bear and finds it very useful in catching seals and fish under water the coat is a silvery or creamy white very long and thick as might be expected in an animal which swims about in the arctic ocean and rests upon cakes of ice the soles of the feet are very long and are covered with thick fur which gives it a large unslippery surface and enables it to climb over ice with facility the food of the polar bear consists principally of fish and seals but the walrus often falls a prey to his strength and cunning and when starved this bear is known to eat marine grass in large quantities carcasses stranded on the beach dead whales and maritime animals afford him an opportunity to gorge himself to the utmost and make enough fat to keep out of the chill of arctic waters so fat do these great bears become that the pregnant female is able to bury herself in the snows of winter and hibernate at the same time suckling her cubs until spring the males do not hibernate but may be seen all winter in hunting seals the polar bear enters the water at some distance from where his prey is basking on the ice and swims with great rapidity toward it keeping well under water and raising the tip of his nose to the surface at intervals for breath at last it rises beneath and in front of the seal and strikes it where it lies or if it escapes into the water captures it with ease for he is a very rapid and expert diver one has been known to dive from a block of ice and capture a passing salmon as deftly as a kingfisher catches a minnow in greenland the polar bear is known to swim from island to island along the shore eating the eggs and young of the innumerable birds which nest there jacques cartier the french navigator in the narrative of his voyage to newfoundland in fifteen thirty four gives a wonderful account of the polar bear's fondness for birds and eggs and the efforts which he will make to procure them an island of birds was discovered off the coast of newfoundland quote, and albeit the said island be fourteen leagues from the mainland notwithstanding bears come swimming thither to eat of the said birds and our men found one there as great as any cow and as white as any swan who in their presence leapt into the sea and upon whitsun monday following our voyage to the land we met her by the way swimming toward land as swiftly as we could sail so soon as we saw her we pursued her with our boats and by main strength took her whose flesh was as good to be eaten as the flesh of a calf of two years old End quote captain sabine reports having seen a polar bear swimming strongly forty miles from land and with no ice in sight upon which to rest so the statement of cartier is perhaps true very few cows weigh fifteen hundred pounds but this is the recorded weight of polar bears as great as any cow killed by whaling crews in the arctic seas in hunting the polar bear the eskimos usually pursue them with dogs and having surrounded them kill them with spears and harpoons while they fight the dogs in the water the polar bear is generally able to escape by swimming and diving and often it happens that by his strength and quickness he overturns boat and mangles the occupants before they can be rescued the skin and fat of the polar bear are more valued by the natives of the north than his flesh which is both fibrous and strong in flavor the members of various arctic expeditions have been glad to eat it however dr kane in particular having had his life and that of his comrades preserved for some time by the meat from the carcass of a great bear which fell into a trap baited simply with an old and greasy stocking whenever possible his men shot the bears on the ice and many pathetic scenes were witnessed by them when the mothers of cubs were killed or when the cubs being slain their mother refused to leave their bodies even when wounded so great is the affection of these bears for each other that when one of a pair is killed the mate remains by the body fondling and caressing it and trying to tempt it by food and endearments to rise again 
it has always been very difficult to keep polar bears in confinement on account of the heat and lack of swimming facilities the great bears at bronx park in new york city are probably the happiest in captivity with a great pool to swim in rocks to climb and a deep cave down into the cool heart of a granite rock where they can always retire and go into cold storage their happiness is largely due to the ingenuity and kindliness of william t hornaday the director who probably understands better what an animal wants than any man in america but after he had provided everything that a well-regulated bear might desire he was distressed to see his pets idle and sulking taking no exercise and declining to utilize any of the facilities except the cold storage department it was at this crisis that mr hornaday heard from some whalers that in the arctic lands polar bears had been seen to play with small boulders by the hour at once he gave his pets a small boulder and immediately all changed they pushed they fought and struggled rolled the stone uphill and downhill threw it into the pool and dived for it and have been happy ever since they had been like children in a fine house but with nothing to play with dane coolidge end of section 24《Birds and Nature》Volume 10, Number 3, October 1901. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Jeff Davis. Section 25 of Birds and Nature, Volume 10, Number 3, October 1901. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Tavarish. O beautiful world of gold, when waving grain is ripe, and apples beam through the hazy gleam, and quails on the fence rails pipe, with pattering nuts and winds, why then? How swiftly falls the white again. G. Cooper, Round the Year. End of section 25. This recording is in the public domain. End of Birds and Nature, Volume 10, Number 3, October 1901.